These and other humble structures like them embody the spirit of Conroe, Texas. They are monuments to entrepreneurship and the determined spirit that built Conroe, known in Texas as the Miracle City. But the citizens of Conroe have long known that so-called miracle was the result of vision and hard work with no small amount of risk taking. The early oil field workers had to scrounge up whatever homes they could. And when Clyde Dolly Gray and his family moved into the Strake Company Superintendent's house in 1946, there was a little house in the backyard that had served as a bunkhouse for the oil field workers, but it soon became an incubator for baseball in Conroe, Texas. Sarah Bess Crow, Dolly Gray's daughter, shares some of her memories of those days. For my family, it was a playhouse, a camping house, a storage room for baseball uniforms, bats, equipment of all kinds, even the records that were played during the games. We always had music, of course, for the seventh inning stretch. My family lived at the ballpark. I can close my eyes and see it all. The dirt parking lot, the smell of the pine trees, <laughs> and I still remember the awful smell of those wool uniforms. Lewis Park, you know, was huge. The wives of the players got to sit right behind home plate. The middle of the grandstand held a large desk for the scorekeepers, for the announcer, and other interested people, sort of a press box. The entire stadium was protected by chicken wire, so no balls ever hit the spectators. Games were always played on Sunday afternoons, but there were many night games over the years, and we, my family, we were the always the last ones to leave the ballpark. The convergence of the dynamic forces of George W. Strake, Dolly Gray, and Ty Cobb at Lewis Park was a fortuitous alignment for Conroe, and their coming together marked the culmination of one of Montgomery County's greatest eras. These three combined to make sports history in Texas, and the historic site where they played is still considered hallowed ground by those who remember. This all happened during the deaths of the Great Depression. The local bank had failed. Yet during this time, Conroe claimed more millionaires per capita than any other town in the United States. And the leader of the pack was George W. Strake. Born in St. Louis in 1894, George W. Strake graduated from the St. Louis University in 1917, and he served during World War I. After completing his tour of duty, he amassed a small fortune in Mexico, only to lose it all in Cuba. Undaunted and still ambitious, he leased some 8,500 acres of land southeast of Conroe. George Strait courageously hawked all of his belongings and acquired the equipment needed to pursue his quest, to find oil and make his fortune. After repeated setbacks, he finally met success. On June 5, 1932, he struck black gold at 5,026 feet. Suddenly, his folly had a name, the Conroe Oil Field, and it quickly became the third largest oil field in the United States. And Conroe was on its way to reinventing itself. People around East Texas now recognized it as the Miracle City. Wealthy beyond anyone's imagination, Strake was also a respected citizen, a devout Catholic, and a member of the orders of Sylvester and Malta. In 1937, George Strake represented the governor and the state of Texas at the United States presidential inauguration. But our story is only half told. If George Strake was the epitome of the Texas oil entrepreneur, Dolly Gray was the very picture of a Texas sports prodigy. When they met, Strake had discovered yet another legendary Texas gusher. My dad was born in Fostoria in 1907. His given name was Clyde Thomas Gray. And eventually, he was given the nickname of a professional Washington baseball pitcher. After that, everyone called him Dolly Gray. He played all the sports, but he was in his element on the baseball diamond. On first base, third base, and especially on the pitcher's mound. Dolly Gray was much in demand at ballparks all across East Texas. He often played for large companies who sponsored teams for public relations. He played for Southern Pacific Railroad. He played for Sinclair Oil. And in 1927, he captained the team for CL Bearing Sporting Goods in Houston, Texas. In 
taking him to the city championship. He even signed on to play for the Houston Buffs in 1930. By the mid-30s, my dad was living in the Conroe area, and one day he found himself batting for George Strake's team, known as the Strake Wildcats. After he scored a home run that night, he got a note from Mr. Strake. It simply read, Report to work on Monday. In those days, baseball was the working man's escape from the drudgery of hard labor. The Wildcats' success made Conroe a baseball town. And as they brought prestige to the city, soon other patrons stepped forward to support the team and always to encourage youngsters to play baseball. Gray obliged his new fan and was soon a superintendent of Strake Oil. Later, he hit a rocket over the school board in center field. He got another note. Tell the rest of the boys that now you have set the pace. There is no reason why this could not be repeated and I stand ready to pay off. As if this duo was not enough, there was a third sports legend to enter the Conroe Diamond. Tyrus Raymond Cobb, known in Conroe circles as Ty Cobb, after the famous Detroit baseball legend, came to Conroe in the early 1940s and was soon playing for the Wildcats. This partnership attracted an all-star team, and by 1948, they were known as the Conroe Wildcats as they tore up Texas Diamonds. They not only won first place in the annual Houston Post Tournament, they also won, for the second time, the Texas State Tournament. After some younger aspiring ball players made themselves a public nuisance by constantly ringing a nearby church bell, Judge Don L. Lewis tried a novel approach, and one that would leave his mark on Conroe for generations. If you boys will pick up your gear and leave here right now, he said, and never ring that bell again, I have a gift for you. The judge proclaimed that he had 10 acres of land at the IGN Railroad, and it was theirs. It was the beginning of Old Lewis Park, and soon Dolly Gray and his Wildcats were taking the field there. Dolly became the original voice of Conroe's Little League program, calling the games many years. And a Texas baseball legend was born, and given a home. Sadly, Ty Cobb's destiny was shortened when he died in 1954 at the age of 37. George W. Strake went on to become a noted Texas philanthropist and passed away in 1969, having left a lasting legacy in Texas. But Dolly Gray? He played until his 60s. He seemed to never tire. He played so long that umpires felt the need to apologize to him before calling a strike. Dolly Gray died in 2002 in his mid-90s. If you listen to your footsteps in these historic structures, the wood floors still creak the way they did when the Gray family gathered the baseball equipment and uniforms and headed to their field of dreams. And when you stroll around Old Lewis Park on a summer Sunday afternoon and let your imagination go, you might still be able to hear the faint echo of bats and the roar of passionate crowds, happy and cheering for the Wildcats and proud to be a part of the Miracle City, Conroe, Texas. The Miracle, driven by Texas entrepreneurial spirit which launched a legacy, the baseball legacy of George Strake and Dolly Gray and Ty Cobb. The entrepreneurial miracle which stitched together a Texas baseball legend and became the foundations of the Conroe story. <laughs>